Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to share some of my, my research with you. <clears throat> so why do we want to upskill our carers? Why do we think this is so important um, today? So if we look at the demands on our health services in, in Northern Ireland at the moment, we can see that over the past five to ten years, we've actually had an increasing demand in the number of admissions to the hospitals, but at the same time we've had a concurrent um, reduction in the number of beds that are available, and we've also been encouraging um, older people to, to reduce the length of stay that they are in, in hospital. So that means that people are, are moving through our service more quickly and back out into the community. But you'll see from recent um, media that we know that there's, our GPs are overloaded. They're finding that there's increasing demands on their time and people are finding it very difficult to be able to get an appointment. There's a nursing shortage. I work in a nursing department and I know that there's a nursing shortage across all of the UK, including Northern Ireland, and there's a shortage of care workers. We also have financial constraints on our, our services. Um, both of our previous speakers have talked about that we have an increasing um, ageing population. This means that we also have an increase in the population of people that are living with longer term illnesses. We also know that by 2060, the ratio of working age people to retirees across the EU is estimated to fall from the, one, the four working people to one retiree today down to two working people to one retiree by 2060. We can't even look at um, thinking about how we could get workers from other countries to come to help support us because the World Health Organization are estimating that by 2030 there's going to be an 18 million shortfall in healthcare workers worldwide and that's actually twice the 7 million that they predicted only back in 2013. And in the EU, they're estimating that by 2025, we're going to need an additional 20 million family carers across the EU. And that includes needing support in Northern Ireland. So many initiatives these days are thinking we need to move to digital technologies. This is the way to improve our healthcare. We know that ICT and telemedicine across um, the UK and Europe it's been estimated this will improve our healthcare efficiency by 20%. We know that healthcare and telecare is on the increase. More of our public services are, are becoming online. It's very common now to book your GP appointment online, to get your prescriptions online. And as um, Shane has already mentioned, there's a massive increase in our <coughs> mobile health apps, which can help encourage a healthy lifestyle and can particularly encourage the self-management of health and we know that here in Northern Ireland there's a big emphasis that we should be encouraging people to be self-managing their health, understanding their own health conditions to help support them in their healthy living and particularly in active ageing. There's currently 100,000 apps out available around managing health and there's been an initiative in the, in the NHS to, to try to find out which of these apps are, are efficient, give accurate data, because our healthcare professionals don't want to engage with them because at the moment they're not sure they're trustworthy. And therefore, are they, a, are they actually a good basis to be making medical judgments? So there's now an NHS mobile apps approved approval service. So have you any idea how many of the 100,000 apps have been approved to date? Well, oh, sorry, I'm not moving on my slides. Um, one. So one has been approved for COPD, and two are under approval. So we have a long way to go to actually help our healthcare professionals, our GPs, our nurses, our physiotherapists, etc., to have confidence in the apps that are being developed. So other initiatives that are available, um, for example, in Florence in Italy, they have a big text messaging service. They have 70 healthcare authorities linked together with over 22,000 patients. And they send text messages, not just about reminding you of your appointment, but they send you healthy 
um, tips. They talk about balanced diet and how you should exercise and all of those things. And they do regular messaging to try and encourage people to, to live a more healthy lifestyle and take responsibility for their own health. There's a growing um, interest in using video links direct to service user homes. So instead of people having to go into the hospital for their consultation, they can do it through video link. There's been a really interesting recent survey last year um, asking people across the EU their, their um, view of if having a robotic assistant. And I thought it was surprisingly that 26% of the people interviewed felt comfortable that if they became more infirm um, or needed companionship in, in older life, they would be quite comfortable with having a robotic um, companion. And there's, there's a lovely lady, this lady at the bottom here, who lives in Italy who has a robotic assistant. She calls him Mr. Robin. And you'll find on YouTube there's a lovely link to her telling you what a difference he's made to her life. So if we're going to move to all of these different ideas of using technologies, how do we help people to engage with them? We know for a long time, over 20 years now, that, do, that health literacy is really important to help people to access their in health information to understand it and to empower them to take control of their own health. But in this 21st century, it's important that people also develop a digital health literacy to enable them to make full use of digital health information and the current and emerging e-health tools and services. So what are the barriers to developing digital health literacy? A recent survey showed across the EU showed that 50 to 62% of respondents, depending on the country, felt they had limited digital health literacy. The barriers that they talked about were that they had no access to the internet or poor digital skills. They lacked the confidence to search and evaluate the information that they found, a lack of trust in the information and a lack of confidence to use this information to discuss with healthcare professionals. And last year there was a survey across all of the UK, including Northern Ireland, about um, how people are using the internet. And they found that the younger generations, 99%, 97%, up to 90% of those aged 55 to 64, are using the internet on a regular basis. But as you get into the older age groups, 65 to 74, only 70% are using it. And the 75 plus, you're down to 41%. That's only four adults out of every 10 in that age group are confident in using the internet. Yet they're the very age group that are needing all the support from these services. Last year, 43.1% of hospital admissions in Northern Ireland were people aged over 65. So this is quite a barrier for um, we need to overcome. So our Discover project was, looking, was one of the aims, part of it was around in social inclusion and part of it was around improving digital health literacy. We had four pilot sites in England, in Greece, in Spain and in the Netherlands and we had other partners who were providing various techni technical support. So our carers were across the four pilot sites were mostly female, although we did have a reasonable representation. Our carers, they had to be over 18 years old to participate in the project, but you'll see that we had participants up in, well into their 90s, who a lot of them had not used a computer before. Some had, but didn't feel that they had very good skills. And others felt they had been skilled, but because the software kept changing, they were losing their confidence year on year about how they could maintain using their computers. So we developed a pla an e-learning platform in collaboration with our carers, cared for people, care workers, and a lot of healthcare professionals and academics. And we built it through a co-design process. And at every stage, we had iterations. And then we, we discussed it, and we got feedback and improved it. And this is showing you how, um, when it was quite well developed, 
that people, people did not want to improve their digital skills or their health literacy skills just by doing computer programs and computer courses. They wanted it really embedded in developing their caring skills and learning more about the health conditions of either themselves or the people they were caring for. So we gave them lots of links to the really good websites that are available around that supporting people with different conditions. And then we also set up these topics whereby you could improve your digital skills or you could learn about, we chose initially, the six most common um, healthcare conditions across Europe. And we also introduced them to the idea of learning through serious games. In this game, you can, you can hover your mouse over, over the image and it, you can find out what could be causing a fall and gives you ideas of how to prevent it. And each of them were linked to all of our topics. After you'd learned something, they were all quite bite-sized learning. You could actually answer a self-assessment quiz to see that you'd made sense of the things that you had read. And some people said older adults wouldn't like to learn like this, and actually they did. They thought it was quite fun. And if you didn't want to do hovering the mouse or you didn't have quite as much dexterity, the, the second image shows you that you could actually click on a hotspot and you, it would take you straight there. So it wasn't quite such a, um, a game approach. We had over 650 people involved in this project. And these are some of the quotes that they gave us. We, 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 had, sur we had questionnaire surveys. We also did focus groups and interviews to get feedback on, on our project. And one of the most important things was they found about high quality information and learning to be able to evaluate what they were finding for themselves. As one said, often the information you find is deceptive and it can actually make you really very anxious and not at all sure that you're doing the right thing for the person that you're caring for. And another lady was saying, I wish I'd learnt about this earlier, because when my husband had a stroke, I didn't get him the best help that he was entitled to, and nobody was telling me that if he'd gone to a dedicated stroke unit, he would have had better care and a better outcome. Through that game, People were learning about preventing falls, and that this was very, very successful. Um, people, because it gave you ideas of how you could prevent falls, it also talked about exercises that you could do with the person that you're caring for to help them build up their strength. And people were really engaging with this across all of our sites. Um, as one of them said, they changed the living space of the person they cared for to make them less likely um, to fall. And that helping them do the exercises was making a huge difference and making people less likely to fall and they weren't um, having to take them into hospital quite as regularly as they had been in the past. Another area that people wanted help with was challenging behaviour. When people um, start moving down the trajectory of dementia, life can become very difficult for carers, both family carers and care workers. And they found that... that the activities they could do on our website was really helping them to be able to cope with this. And even if it wasn't dementia, sometimes people, um, if they've had particularly um, traumatic experiences, find it very difficult to adjust. And this was helping giving them, um, they were finding information that would help them to do this. But it also they knew that it was good quality information and therefore was trustworthy. They also looked about improving the quality of care and so how technologies could help with independence because a lot of people don't know of the different active, um, telehealth and telecare opportunities that are out there or the different gadgets that you can use. So they found all of these things were really helping them in their caring role and they were confident that they were selecting appropriate devices or services. Then we also had a lot of stakeholders because we wanted to know that one of the things we wanted to know was were all of these activities and helping improving people's digital health literacy, was it actually making a difference? And our stakeholders was, was, were seeing that when they had consultations with the carers and the cared for person, that actually there was a much better dialogue now. 
that there was a real understanding. The questions that were being asked were more in depth. There was a better understanding of what was needed. And the health of the, the people who were being cared for was improving because there was a better understanding of their health condition. So our findings were that the carers were developing new knowledge, whether they were family carers or care workers, and they were finding these really valuable. We had a, um, the lowest was improvement was in computing skills, but all of the other areas around understanding services more, being able to evaluate websites more accurately so that you knew you were getting the, the best information, understanding technologies for care, improving their health knowledge was all over 75-80%. And another benefit, because we're interested in social inclusion, was that people felt more supported through joining our project, both the care workers, the cared for people, and they would recommend to other carers, care workers, and to their employers to participate in the project. And you can see that one of our, our questions on our questionnaire was around how they felt about their, their own well-being over the past two weeks. And they were reporting that they, from participating in the project, it was improving their, their sense of well-being. They felt more cheerful and in good spirits and more calm and relaxed. And our care workers, although it didn't improve that, that measure, we had far fewer of them reporting that they actually never felt in, in a good place. So that was a really, um, a really important side part to our project. And another uh, um, surprising finding was that when we started the project, less than 25% of our carers and care workers felt the people they cared for would benefit from developing their digital skills. And by the time we got to the project, over 85% felt they would recommend this kind of approach to the people they were caring for. So it's a, re a real improvement in understanding. The challenges of, that are facing us are that we really do need to enhance the digital skills and digital health literacy skills of family carers, care workers and cared for people. We need to be raising awareness of the opportunities that arise from telehealth and telecare and of being online. We need to help older people overcome their fear of computers some still, there's over 4.8 million older people in um, Northern Ireland who do not use the internet yet. So we need to help them under, overcome that fear and encourage them to engage if we want them to participate in this 21st century digital world. We need to overcome the stigma of using some of these devices because older people think it's identifying them as being old and they don't want to be made vulnerable in that way. So recommendations for, for policy makers. It's important that we improve and increase the opportunities for programmes to help pe develop people's digital health literacy. And they need to be based on the, health, the regular health conditions that people are experiencing because they find it quite difficult to engage in something that's too generic. It needs to be focused in on the conditions that, that either they themselves have or the people they're caring for. We need to have seamless linking between all these services, between all the carers, the health professionals, so that there's a real understanding between the different groups and we can move forward together. We also need to make sure we enable care home residents to, to be able to use digital devices because all too often there's no digital devices available for them or if they are available, there's nobody skilled enough to help them to use them or they haven't got enough time to sit on a one-to-one -one basis to help people to use them. And it's really important that we um, adequately resource and accelerate this NHS app approval process. Because without that, there is no way services are going to rely on mobile, ha mobile ha app data. And this is just some of the carers who've been involved in the project. So thank you for your attention.